It is day seven of the Israel-Hamas war. 168 hours and counting. This war started last Saturday, but the larger Israel-Palestine conflict is decades old. And it all started here, in the city of Jerusalem, where I'm currently standing. This is a place overlooking the old city. You can see the Dome of the Rock. It is part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, or what the Jews called, call the Temple Mount. If you talk about Israel and Palestine, you cannot not mention Jerusalem. So we had to bring you here today. Plus it's Friday. That means Friday prayers at Al-Aqsa. Hamas called for protests and clashes today. Israeli forces are out in large numbers to prevent that. So it's been a tense day. We drove around the city of Jerusalem. We went to the old city, the hub of tensions. We'll bring you a ground report from there. Meanwhile, top US diplomats are in the region. We'll tell you what they're up to. Who benefits the most from this war? Why anti-Semitism is on the rise across the world? Will Hezbollah join this fighting? Is this the end of the road for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? And a look at how the conflict is escalating into a narrative war. We'll bring you all that and more. Let's get started. West Asia is at war again, and we are in the thick of it. As the decades-old conflict reignites, we bring you the most comprehensive coverage from Tel Aviv. When war breaks out, you see a lot of movement, a lot of action at airports. Who is making gains? How is the world reacting? And what is the fallout? We'll be here bringing you all the action through the non-stop sirens and the flying rockets to bring you the full story. Catch all the live action from this West Asian war zone only on Vantage Israel Edition. Seven days and counting, some graphs are constantly moving up, like the death toll and the number of strikes. For perspective, let me share two figures with you. In the last six days, Israel has fired 6,000 munitions into Gaza. 6,000. And they've dropped some 4,000 tons of explosives. That alone should tell you the scale of this offensive. And the ground invasion has not even begun yet. What about attacks from, from the other side, from Hamas? Well, they've not ended, although their intensity has reduced. Border villages in Israel are still coming under attack, including the village of Zerot that we visited earlier this week. Rockets are being fired from the Gaza Strip. On Thursday, four civilians were injured, including two uh, being critically injured. But given Israel's superior defences, the damage is lesser. Also, Hamas is set to be saving rockets. They plan to use the stockpile when Israel launches a bigger offensive. Overnight, the Israeli military has fired more than 750 missiles. The IDF says they're firing every 30 seconds. What does this mean for Gaza? sheer misery. Israel has also issued a warning for the people of Gaza today, leave in 24 hours, move to the south of Gaza. But it's impossible because all of Gaza is small and cramped. Let me pull up a map for you. This is the Gaza Strip, 41 kilometers long and around 12 kilometers wide at its widest point. It is surrounded by Israel, Egypt and the Mediterranean. 2.3 million people live on this strip. One million of them are children. This strip has seven border crossings. Six are controlled by Israel. One of them opens into Egypt. All of them are closed right now. So basically, ordinary Gazans have nowhere to go. And they're being hit by airstrikes every minute. I can't keep up with the numbers of those killed. Why this crime? I say thank God that our martyrs are in heaven. But we are sad. 
Everyone is sad for the people and the loved ones they lost. You are sad about losing your home, but homes can be rebuilt. And with one death, we will have a thousand martyrs. Gaza is a picture of devastation. Buildings have been reduced to rubble. There is no electricity, fuel has run out, hospitals are overwhelmed, and drinking water is scarce. We're very worried about how this will evolve over time, particularly if the humanitarian situation is not addressed. The, the people that are seeking shelter and, and striving to survive in this environment are, are going to get only in worse and worse situations as time goes on. He's right. It is going to get worse. Israel's new ultimatum is like a death warrant for Gazans. They're being told to move to the south. The IDF calls for the evacuation of all civilians from Gaza City. I can I'll zoom in in a second. From Gaza City, from their homes, southwards, for their own safety and protection, and to move to the area south of Wadi Gaza, the river Gaza, as shown on the map. What does that mean? Let's look at the map again. The north of Gaza Strip is the most populated. It includes the Gaza City, which is the biggest city on this entire strip. Israel wants the entire population of the north the northern region, to move south of Wadi Gaza. You can see it on the map. That's Wadi Gaza. It's a nature reserve, and Israel wants the entire northern population to go here. We're talking about displacing around 1.1 million people. They're being asked to leave their home in 24 hours. That would mean around 40,000 people being relocated every hour. It will not happen. Plus, how and where will these people go? There are bombs falling everywhere. The roads are broken, their homes are destroyed, their family members are hospitalized. How do you move in the middle of all of this? It's a recipe for what the United Nations calls devastating humanitarian consequences. We need a corridor to provide medical services and, and so on. That's what I would, I would ask, ask for. One is to protect civilians and second to provide them with the support uh, they need, be it food, medical services, supplies and the other uh, things they, they need. Israel says the evacuations are necessary because they want to reduce civilian casualties. But the Hamas is challenging this. They're calling it Israeli propaganda. And they're asking civilians in Gaza to stay put. Basically, there are no good options for them. The Hamas sees Gazans as human shields and the Israelis see them as collateral damage. While the attacks continue, it's important to define the end game. And that is invariably a political decision. What is Israel looking to achieve here? How far does it want to take this fight? These will all be political calls and they'll be shaped by the politics and power play in this region. Among the biggest players is the United States of America. Also Israel's top supporter. As we speak, top American diplomats are in the region, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. They're here. They're meeting key stakeholders. Blinken landed yesterday. He met Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It was a show of support, a way to reiterate that America has Israel's back. Let's see you. Sorry, it's under these circumstances. Yeah, but thank you for your very much. We're here. We're not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere. That was Blinken's message. He met the Israeli president, he met survivors of the Hamas attack, and he pledged more support. The message that I bring to Israel is this. You may be strong enough on your own to defend yourself, but as long as America exists, you will never ever have to. We will always be there by your side. But Israel isn't the only place that Blinken is visiting. He's looking at a wider outreach in the region. The idea is to prevent this conflict from spreading. So from Israel, Blinken headed to Jordan. There he met Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and the Jordanian King, Abdullah. His next stops include Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. All of them are key stakeholders in the region. All of them are also key US allies. Some of them are talking to Hamas. So Blinken wants to engage with all of them basically establish Washington's presence. Meanwhile, another top U.S. diplomat is in Tel Aviv. I'm talking about U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. He landed in Israel today, and this is what he said. We will remain in close contact with our valued partners across the region, and security assistance from the Department of Defense is already rapidly flowing into Israel. That includes munitions and air defense capabilities, and other equipment and resources. 
The US is moving quickly to boost Israel's military. Its biggest aircraft carrier is already in the region. It has also deployed aircraft to West Asia. Now, a second US carrier strike group has also been deployed. The first shipment of munitions is also here. Special forces are coordinating with Israel's intelligence. And in the coming days, more help is expected. So basically, the US is going all out. But this conflict in West Asia has also left America exposed. Their influence and their presence is shrinking. For all their solidarity with Israel, there is no U.S. ambassador in the country right now. No U.S. ambassador in Israel. The last envoy left some four months back. Joe Biden nominated a successor, but he's yet to be confirmed. The U.S. Senate has not even held his confirmation hearing. And that's not all. The U.S. has no ambassador in Egypt, in Kuwait, in Lebanon and in Oman. And that is definitely going to affect decisions. And then there is U.S. politics overshadowing any response. Joe Biden was supposed to preside over an era of peace in West Asia. Instead, under his watch, Israel is looking at its worst conflict in decades. And what are the American politicians doing? Well, they're blaming President Biden for releasing frozen Iranian funds. That's $6 billion of money going to Iran. There are a lot of reports about Iran's role in this war, about their backing for Hamas. So releasing Iranian funds just a week before the war was not a good look for America, and they seem to have realized this. Now, the U.S. has convinced Qatar to withhold that money. Qatar was acting as the middleman in this deal. The funds went from the U.S. to Qatar and from there to Iran, and now they've been blocked. Needless to say, Tehran has slammed this move. But for Joe Biden, this is about saving face, because next year is election year in the U.S., and he cannot go into it looking like the president who helped fund the attack on Israel. Now let's turn our attention to northern Israel. It is on high alert, not because of Hamas, but because of the lurking presence of Hezbollah in Lebanon. There are fears of an escalation in the north of Israel, getting caught in a two-front or even a three-front conflict. The question on everyone's mind is this. Will Hezbollah join the war, especially after today's events? Before this meeting, I had the chance to meet separately with Prime Minister Najib Mikati and also Syed Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah. You heard him. Iran's foreign minister is in Lebanon. He met with the Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah. And both leaders shared words of warning. First, a bit of background. Hezbollah is a militant organization based in Lebanon and an active player in the region. Like Hamas, they're seen as an Iranian proxy. They're fostered and funded by Iran. Like Hamas, they also double up as a political party and they're also a sworn enemy of Israel. But here's the difference. Hezbollah is a far more powerful player than Hamas and its focus is not just on Israel. It's a much bigger player in West Asian politics. And it has far more experience of real battle. So it's understandable that Israelis are on their guard. But so far, Hezbollah has been relatively quiet, almost too quiet, you could say, especially considering this statement from last Sunday. We salute all our beloved Palestinian resistance factions in Palestine, no matter to whom they belong. And they are all united in the resistance. We tell those that the nation is with you. Our heart, minds, souls, our history and guns and rockets and all that we have is with you because we are the resistance that was founded originally for you and for Palestine and Jerusalem. He said Hezbollah's guns and rockets were with the Palestinians, not Hamas, the Palestinians. And this statement was a mix of posturing and a show of solidarity. But Hezbollah has not joined the war yet. They have been, there have been minor incidents of cross-border fire. Some militants from Lebanon have been killed. Two were neutralized while trying to infiltrate Israel's northern border. Three members of Hezbollah were killed due to Israeli shelling. Both these incidents took place on Monday. On Tuesday, their funerals took place, rallies and protests were held. Again, more posturing, but no invasion. Instead, there's been a continuation of cross-border shelling, artillery and rocket fire, but no Israeli casualties yet. Now, part of this is, of course, because of the threat of retaliation and memories of the last war. That was in the year 2006. Hezbollah fought Israel in the year 2006, and the casualties were overwhelmingly from Lebanon. More than 1,100 Lebanese people were killed then. What about the Israelis? 55 deaths. So there was a massive power imbalance, and that imbalance still exists. But it has decreased over the years. 
Back in 2006, Hezbollah had about 15,000 missiles. By 2021, it reportedly had around 130,000, so almost 10 times more. And the types of missiles have evolved as well. Earlier, they reportedly had Soviet-era rockets. Today, they have precision-guided missiles. And this is courtesy their participation in the civil war in Syria. Hezbollah has been fighting alongside Iran and Russia and Syria. They're fighting on behalf of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The group has picked up weapons and valuable combat experience in Syria. They're also used to urban warfare. It makes them dangerous in the event of a ground assault on Israel. Then there are the numbers. Hezbollah boasts of around 100,000 fighters. For context, the Hamas attack on Saturday was conducted by hundreds. The sheer number of fighters makes Hezbollah more dangerous, and Israel knows this. It has been flexing its military might as a warning. Since the Hamas war began, Israel has sent troops north as well. Thousands of reservists are at the border with Lebanon and tanks have been lined up along the 81-kilometer boundary. Israel has also been issuing threats. It has said that it will bomb Lebanon back to the Stone Age if Hezbollah attacks. It has promised to use overwhelming force. So obviously, Hezbollah will be wary. And to add to all of this, the presence of the Americans can be daunting. You know, the U.S. has deployed its most advanced aircraft carrier in the region, the USS Gerald Ford. Reports say another carrier is on its way. American jets are at the ready in all U.S. bases in West Asia. All of this is meant to get Israel's enemies to back down. We mentioned this yesterday. And all these moves, Israeli and Americans, seem to have been working. But then today's meeting took place between Iran and Hezbollah. Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, said they discussed, and I'm quoting, everyone's responsibilities and the positions that need to be taken. Iran's foreign minister was asked about the possibility of a second war front. He said, and I quote, every possibility and decision by the other currents of the resistance is possible. And he added, the continuation of the war crimes against Palestine and Gaza will definitely be met with reactions. So the message is clear. Israel's enemies are uniting and anything can happen. Now let's move from the second to the third possible front. That is the West Bank. The West Bank is home to Palestinians. It also includes half of the holy city of Jerusalem, the eastern half. The old city houses some of the most sacred sites for all Abrahamic religions. But one shrine is at the center of the conflict between the Jewish and Muslim people, the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, known to the Jewish people as the Temple Mount. The Hamas attack on Saturday invoked the shrine's name. They call the attack the Al-Aqsa Flood. Today, the compound is tense. Israeli security forces have been deployed all around it. Hamas asked for a demonstration here today. It is hoping for chaos. And Israel wants to nip this in the bud. We went to the old city earlier today. Our next report is from Ground Zero in Jerusalem. Today is Friday, the most important day for Muslim prayers. And in Jerusalem lies one of the most important prayer sites, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It lies in the heart of Jerusalem, one of the holiest cities for all Abrahamic faiths. A city that countless wars have been fought over, one that's no stranger to tension. We're in East Jerusalem, overlooking the old city. It's a tense Friday here. I'm sure you can hear the announcements in the background. Uh, Hamas has made an appeal. Uh, it has urged Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and other parts of the country to march up to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound and clash with the Israeli forces. And uh, uh, on all roads leading up to the, to the mosque, we've seen barricades at multiple places. Uh, we have seen protests and clashes in the West Bank in the past few days. More than 30 uh, Palestinians are said to have been killed uh, in the action. Uh, uh, that is according to official reports that have come in. Uh, behind me, what you see is uh, the, the golden structure that you see is called the Dome of the Rock. Uh, this is uh, uh, an Islamic shrine. It is at the center of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Uh, or what is called the Temple Mount uh, by the Jews, Temple Mount. Uh, this is uh, the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina and uh, the holiest site in Judaism. 
And this is also at the center of the wider Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, like I said, it's a tense Friday here, and the challenge before the Israeli authorities today will be to ensure uh, that the conflict does not escalate in Jerusalem. The Al-Aqsa compound is the third holiest site in Islam. It's said to be the spot where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. The compound contains the Golden Dome of the Rock and the silver-domed Al-Aqsa Mosque itself. They are both located inside the 14-hectare compound. Muslims refer to the compound as Al-Haram Al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary. The site is sacred to the Jewish people as well. They believe the compound is where two ancient Jewish temples once stood. These temples were the heart of the Jewish religion, home to their high priest. The temple was raised to the ground in antiquity, the second time by the Romans in 70 BC. But the Temple Mount is still considered the central point of the Jewish religion. So you see why the compound is sacred to both the Muslim and the Jewish people. There is a tenuous agreement regarding the site. Neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians manage it. They have a third party as custodian, the neighboring country of Jordan. Jordan manages the site. As part of the agreement, only Muslim people are allowed to pray there. Most Jewish people pray beneath the site, at the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall. This is the status quo, and attempts to change it are considered provocations. Hamas and other groups point to such provocations to justify their attacks. They even called Saturday's attack Al-Aqsa Flood. And today, Hamas wanted Palestinians to demonstrate at the compound. But Israel is not having it. It has ramped up security in Jerusalem. The police is patrolling every street. You see armed security officials at every checkpoint. The message is clear. Israel will not allow any trouble at Al-Aqsa today. We are in the old city of Jerusalem at the Jaffa Gate and uh, uh, on any other day, uh, the, the area behind me is packed with people, uh, with tourists, uh, with, uh, uh, with the locals who are here, with shoppers. But today you can only see uh, security officials armed to the teeth uh, and, and the few worshippers who are coming out uh, after Friday prayer. So this is practically deserted and that is the story of all of Jerusalem. It looks like a ghost town. Uh, as we drove uh, up to this place, we saw uh, only security officials and journalists along the way and a lot of barricades. Uh, so it's a tense Friday afternoon uh, for the people of Jerusalem. The Friday prayer is just getting over and uh, security officials have been deployed here in large numbers to ensure that the situation remains under control in the wake of uh, the call for protest that came from Hamas yesterday. Some people have managed to pray within the compound. Others are finding it difficult to get inside because of all the security. They're praying outside the compound instead. Israel's precautions seem to have been necessary. There are reports of clashes outside the old city of Jerusalem. But things were largely kept under control today as they had to be. The last thing Israel needs is another front opening up on the West Bank. We talked about the players, we talked about the stakeholders, we talked about the politics. Now let's talk about the beneficiaries. I know it sounds like a paradox. This is after all a war, so who can possibly benefit? Well, the defence industry. Wars can lead to an increase in defence spending. The more prolonged and intense the conflict, the greater the demand for weapons. And it is obvious. A government that is fighting a war will obviously spend more money. So nations invest heavily in technology, in weaponry and in infrastructure. And this heightened demand helps defence companies across the globe. It causes their stocks to rally. Take US defence stocks for example, they've added some $23 billion in market value since the war began. On Monday, Northrop Grumman soared by 12%. General Dynamics jumped by some 9%. Lockheed Martin gained 8% and RTX rallied 4%. And this is only expected to grow in the days ahead. Take Lockheed Martin, for example. This company makes the F-35 fighter jets. They're used by the Israeli military. They also make Black Hawk helicopters. Northrop Grumman makes combat vehicles. All of these are weapons that Israel uses, and all of these are weapons that Israel is going to need in the near future. The US will be sending more weapons to Israel in the coming days, so the stocks of these companies are expected to rally. And this won't be the first time that this is happening. Last year, two defense stocks got a huge boost. That was when Russia invaded Ukraine. 
As of today, the U.S. has spent more than $40 billion in military aid to Ukraine. So the biggest beneficiary is the American defense uh, sector. And that is likely to be the case in this war as well. This is one of the harshest realities of war, whether we like it or not. For some people, wars cost lives. For others, they drive value. For defense companies, wars act as economic stimulus. They bolster sales. They fuel job creation and sometimes they also boost local economies. Now, of course, this does raise some moral and ethical questions like, is this profiting from human suffering? More importantly, is this motivation to prolong a conflict? Plus, there is the investor dilemma. Defense stocks are often called sin stocks or warmonger investments. But the label here does not really matter. These stocks surge massively when a war breaks out. And that makes them very attractive for investors. Currently, the world is dealing with two wars, the Ukraine war and now the one that's being fought here, the Israel-Hamas war. Defence spending has already been on the rise this year. Europe has ramped up military spending. It is the highest the continent is spending since the Cold War on weapons. Asian nations have also bumped spending. Defence budgets of countries like Japan and South Korea grew by 7% in 2022. India's defence budget was $81.4 billion in 2022. This is a jump of 6% from the previous year. Currently, global military spending is at $2.24 trillion, which is 2.2% of the world's GDP. Chances are it will only rise in the days ahead. Israel's bombardment of Gaza continues. And why are they doing that? Simply put, before armies put their boots on ground, they go on the offensive with long-range strikes. This is done to reduce numbers of the enemy. So Israel's bombing of Gaza can mean only one thing, preparation for a larger ground offensive. But now they're facing fresh accusations. This comes from the Human Rights Watch, a group that advocates for human rights, as the name suggests, Human Rights Watch. They say Israel has used white phosphorus munitions in Gaza. As proof, this group cites videos from the war. They show the cloud burst of white phosphorus ammunition. And Human Rights Watch says that this munition has been used in Lebanon as well. So what is Israel's response? Well, so far they've denied all accusations. Israel's military has said this, that they are not aware of the use of weapons containing white phosphorus in Gaza. So they mention Gaza, but not Lebanon. Which brings us to another question. What exactly is white phosphorus munition? As the name suggests, white phosphorus munitions are weapons which have high amounts of a particular chemical, that is white phosphorus. It is highly flammable. It is extracted from phosphate containing rocks. In solid form, white phosphorus has a wax-like texture and this makes it extremely sticky and hard to remove. It may be yellow or white in colour and it has a pungent garlic-like odour. When exposed to oxygen, white phosphorus ignites spontaneously, it catches fire and it produces toxic fumes which can be white or yellowish, white or yellowish smoke. So it is dangerous, yet it is widely used, more commonly used than you would imagine. According to the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC, white phosphorus is used in day-to-day -day activities. Industries use this chemical to manufacture fertilizers. They also make cleaning compounds and sometimes use it as food additives in processed meat. You heard that right. A chemical so dangerous is being used to even preserve food. But its key utility is military. It is used to make bombs. And here's how white phosphorus bombs work. They're called incendiary weapons, meaning an explosive that can spread fire and smoke rapidly. This type of weapon can be used to deploy smoke screens, to illuminate the battlefield during night combat, and to even destroy military equipment using flames. Now, white phosphorus is known for quickly spreading fires across a large area. Before the munition impacts the ground, it bursts mid-air. It spreads a web of chemical particles that come in contact with oxygen and they burn at temperatures above 800 degrees Celsius. These bombs cause injuries far more severe than conventional bombs. If you come in contact with this chemical, your eyes will begin watering. Your skin may suffer second-degree burns. You will see smoke on your body where white phosphorus is present. But the real danger is when this chemical is swallowed or inhaled. It can lead to anything between a stomachache and death. Lack of treatment right after exposure can lead to multiple organ failure, a collapse of the nervous system and death. So clearly this is an extremely dangerous chemical, but that it is not banned under international law. It is categorized as an incendiary weapon and not a chemical weapon. But it cannot be used against civilians or military targets in civilian areas. That is what the law states. 
that this weapon can be used by militaries only for creating smoke screens. Now, Israel has not ratified this protocol. It is not bound by its provisions. And Israel has been accused of using white phosphorus munitions in the past too. In 2008, it is said to have dropped these bombs on Gaza. In 2006, in the war with Lebanon, Israel acknowledged using white phosphorus. And it's hardly the first or the only country to do so. The use of white phosphorus munitions goes back to World War I. These bombs were also used in the Second World War. American forces dropped them on Vietnam. British forces used white phosphorus during the Falkland War against Argentina. The US even dropped these bombs on Iraq and Afghanistan. Russia too has been accused of using white phosphorus munitions. This was during the Chechen Wars and now recently in Ukraine. So many nations have dropped such bombs and no one held them accountable. That's because the laws are not strict. But then even if they were, who would enforce them? Now let's focus on the man who's leading the charge for Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, former military commando turned prime minister, Israel's longest serving PM, also among its most controversial ones. Netanyahu has formed a unity government with his political rival Benny Gantz. A war cabinet has been constituted. It will oversee Israel's war on Hamas. It gives Netanyahu more power and elbow room, but it's hardly the end of his troubles. This attack happened on his watch. There is no analog for this kind of violence in Israeli history. And it's a big blow to Netanyahu's image as an uncompromising leader. Bibi, as he's widely known, is facing perhaps his biggest political test. What he does next in this war will determine not just Israel's fate, but also his own. Here's a report. In the Israel-Palestine cauldron, the events of the last week have been unprecedented. The last time they went to battle like this was perhaps in 1948. That war ended in 1949 with Israel's victory. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu would hope that history repeats itself. He has vowed to finish Hamas, the group responsible for the terror attack just a week back. This was his first response after Saturday's massacre. Citizens of Israel, we are at war, not in an operation or in infighting rounds, but at war. This morning, Hamas launched a murderous surprise attack against the state of Israel and its citizens. I have ordered an extensive mobilization of reserves and that we return fire of a magnitude that the enemy has not known. The enemy will pay an unprecedented price. Israel called it its 9-11. And Netanyahu's response was reminiscent of US President George W. Bush's speech after the worst terror attack on American soil. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary actions, and Israeli politics witnessed something similar. Political rivals joined hands to form a unity government. Centrist Benny Gantz joined Netanyahu's right-wing government to fight Hamas. Citizens of Israel, this evening we have established a national emergency government. The people of Israel are united, and today its government is united. But this was the only good news for Netanyahu, if you can call it that, given the circumstances. Bibi, as he is widely known, has his back to the wall. Saturday's attack was the worst that Israel has seen in decades, and it happened with Netanyahu in charge. So pressure is mounting on Bibi. There are reports over intelligence failures and military mistakes. Shocking given Israel's reputation in both fields. How the Israeli government was caught napping while Hamas executed its horrific plan. Today, Netanyahu wants to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth. The savage attacks that Hamas perpetrated against innocent Israelis are mind-boggling. Slaughtering families in their homes, massacring hundreds of young people at an outdoor festival, kidnapping scores of women, children, and elderly, even Holocaust survivors. Hamas terrorists bound, burned, and executed children. They are savages. Hamas is ISIS. And just as the forces of civilization united to defeat ISIS, the forces of civilization must support Israel in defeating Hamas. But this wasn't always his view of the group. 
In March 2019, at a Likud party meeting, Netanyahu said, and I quote, those who want to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state should support the strengthening of Hamas and the transfer of money to Hamas. He went on to add at that same meeting, and I quote again, this is part of our strategy, to differentiate between the Palestinians in Gaza and the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria. Often, the best laid plans of prime ministers and presidents go awry. But rarely do these backfire as badly as it has for Netanyahu. His strategy has been to allow Hamas some room to maneuver. Why? In order to weaken the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. For decades, Netanyahu has pursued this so-called separation strategy. Solidify Hamas's control over Gaza, cut the Palestinian Authority to size to preclude the possibility of it emerging as a viable partner for negotiations. Netanyahu has also pushed a controversial policy of weakening the judiciary inside Israel. Remember, he's facing corruption charges. This move, seen as a judicial coup of sorts, has led to widespread protests within Israel for months now. So Netanyahu wasn't soaring on the popularity charts before the war. And after Saturday's attack, calls have only grown for Bibi's resignation. Netanyahu has been in power from 1996 to 1999 from 2009 to 2021, and again from December of last year. Bibi is the longest tenured prime minister in Israel's history. He's also the chairman of the Likud party. So he has no one else to blame for the crisis Israel is facing. The buck stops with him. And the timing seems particularly cruel. He was on the verge of completing his masterstroke, peace with the Arab world while ignoring the Palestinians via the Israel-Saudi normalization deal. Hamas, the same group that he backed, derailed his plans. And now Bibi finds himself in the middle of an ugly, bloody and possibly long war. But don't rule him out just yet. Netanyahu is a political survivor. He's also known as the magician. But this time he faces his biggest test for political survival. If he does manage to overcome this, it would be nothing short of magic indeed. Now let's look at another front in this war, the narrative battle. Since Hamas attacked Israel on Saturday, you've been seeing new horrors every day, from the kidnappings at the music festival to the destroyed kibbutz, and now to the devastation in Gaza. Both sides are sharing images, images that show indescribable horrors. The idea is to highlight the other side's barbarity, to evoke sympathy, and then to justify their side's actions. These pictures leave you shocked and angry. They also leave you confused. They breed moral confusion. They blur the line between who is right and who is not. And it's all by design. Because this is what these images are meant to do. To appeal to your humanity and to make you question the motives of both sides. We say this is problematic and dangerous. And this is what we want to address tonight. Drawing moral equivalence in this battle is plain wrong because one side is a military, on the other side is a terrorist organization. This war was triggered by Hamas. That's where this round of violence began. It's important to remember that. Israel's primary target is the Hamas. But Hamas's primary targets were Israeli civilians. You cannot compare the two. In the weeks ahead, the pictures from Gaza will look much worse and they will make Israel look like the bigger threat to peace. So it's important to not lose sight of the big picture. Innocent people have died on both sides, including innocent children, reportedly hundreds of them. And now they've become ammunition in this narrative war. Visuals of their bodies are being circulated. It is horrific. And the narratives surrounding them are just as terrible. Using pictures of dead babies in Gaza to justify the Hamas attack is reprehensible. Nothing can justify Saturday's assault. It was a terrorist attack, one that deliberately targeted civilians. Hamas and Israel have been old enemies. Both have accused each other of atrocities. Both have perpetrated them. But all grievances and anger cannot be directed at non-combatants. That is a war crime. Taking hostages, deliberately killing innocents, these are crimes. Wherever you stand on the Palestinian issue, you cannot defend Hamas right now. And at this point, I must underline this. Hamas is not Palestine. The actions of Hamas do not have to be conflated with the Palestinian issue or the Palestinian cause. They attacked on Saturday despite knowing the consequences. They knew what would happen. They knew the sheer force that Israel was capable of deploying. They knew that innocents would get caught in the crossfire, but Hamas attacked anyway. Did they think they could win? No, they did not. 
Did they think they would deliver any real long-term solution? No, they did not. Then why did they attack? Simply to inflict pain. But that pain is not limited to Israel. Hamas have regularly used Palestinians in Gaza as human shields, and even now, many will find it difficult to escape their grasp. Israel has given Gazans 24 hours to move to the south. Even if they want to, many cannot. Hamas won't let them. The same Palestinians that Hamas claims to represent will be used as cannon fodder. How then can anyone rationalize their actions? It takes ethical and moral clarity to accept what is wrong. Neither Hamas nor their supporters have it. And staying with narratives, they shape our worldview. But what happens when the hate spills over and distorts that narrative? Today, a teacher was killed in France. A 20-year-old man of Chechen origin attacked a high school. And this assault has rattled France. Since the war began between Israel and Hamas, the West has been reeling with rising tensions. France recorded at least 100 anti-Semitic incidents this week. Similar cases in the UK more than quadrupled this week. This is compared to the same period last year, four times higher. Some Jewish schools have been shut in the country. The US saw 488% rise in anti-Semitic online threats. Why do you think this is happening? And what are the leaders doing about it? Our next report tells you. As the conflict between Israel and Hamas rages for another day, the world faces a dire threat, the surge in anti-Semitism. It refers to hostility or discrimination against Jews, and the West is bracing for a rapid rise in such incidents. Based on reports since Hamas's attack on Israel, anti-Semitic incidents in the UK have more than quadrupled. Just this week, 89 anti-Semitic incidents have been recorded. That's more than a four-fold rise. In the same period last year, only 21 incidents were recorded. Even schools aren't safe. Due to security concerns, two Jewish schools have temporarily shut down in London. France faces a similar concern. It has Europe's largest Muslim and Jewish populations. Since the attack, anti-Semitic acts have risen here as well. It recorded more than 100 anti-Semitic acts this week, compared to 436 in the whole of 2022. The US faces a similar problem. There's increased online chatter from neo-Nazis, white supremacists and pro-Hamas extremists. Anti-Jewish threats on Telegram, a platform popular with white supremacists, surged by an alarming 488% in the first 18 hours of Saturday, the day of the attack. Offline, reports of anti-Semitic incidents are sporadic but persistent. For instance, in Utah, a synagogue was forced to evacuate after receiving a bomb threat. In Missouri, a swastika was spray-painted on the side of a truck. In New York City, a protester attending a pro-Hamas rally was seen brandishing a swastika. While this problem is only growing, what are world leaders doing about it? Many US cities have reinforced security around Jewish houses of worship. Police is investigating anti-Semitic incidents. New York is on high alert. We uh, know the entire world uh, is horrified by the attacks the terrorist organization Hamas has made on our brothers and sisters in Israel. And we are deeply disturbed by the message of hate, urgent violence in other communities in this region and around the world. It is not acceptable. Meanwhile, the UK also increased patrols across its cities. They've heightened security in Jewish schools. The UK announced $3.6 million for a charity that helps protect Jewish community sites. France has taken similar security measures. We are fighting and we will always fight so that no one will be ever fearful on our soil. No suspicion, no division between us should ever exist within our nation. Since Saturday, 24 people have been arrested in France. Security measures have been heightened. The French government has assigned 10,000 police to protect 500 Jewish sites. The Parisian police has banned pro-Palestinian gatherings, fearing that protesters could incite racial hate. Our duty in this moment we are witnessing is to stay united as a nation and as a republic. There have been alerts that were reported to us in the last hours and days concerning students of the Jewish faith being the target of aggression in their schools. And let me say that on this point, we will be completely uncompromising. 
police in Germany's capital Berlin also banned planned pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Meanwhile, Australian police are considering applying special stop-and-search powers. This is a first in almost two decades. It will apply to attendees at an upcoming pro-Palestinian rally. That the powers we are considering um, authorising will include any person who attends uh, Hyde Park on Sunday with the intention to assemble and perhaps protest uh, will be subject to searching powers where we don't need reasonable cause to search. In this war, the rise of anti-Semitism is another battlefront that's opening. And while Israel fights Hamas, the world can join hands to fight against this insidious enemy. Every war has a price. For Israel, the cost of this war against Hamas stands at $6.8 billion. That's 1.5% of Israel's GDP. It's quite the hit to Israel's economy, partly because 300,000 people suddenly stopped working. I'm talking about the reservists' call for duty. That's an unprecedented number in recent history, 300,000. These reservists are not full-time soldiers, remember. They're teachers, tech workers, entrepreneurs, farmers, attorneys, doctors, and now they're not doing their day job. This will hurt Israel's economy. Then comes the country's tech industry. It's been growing rapidly. More than 500 global tech companies have businesses in Israel. This war is bound to impact them. Reports say some of them are looking to shift business operations to other parts of West Asia and even to India. Here's a report. Since Hamas staged the surprise attack, 150,000 members of Israel's armed forces are fighting a bloody war against them. That includes the Standing Army, Air Force and Navy. But they aren't alone. Israel has a reserve force. It's made up of about 450,000 members. 300,000 of them have been called for duty. The largest mobilization since the 1973 Yom Kippur War. But there's a flip side to this. 300,000 reservists are fighting this bloody war, meaning 300,000 people have left their jobs. You see, reservists make up a cross-section of the Israeli society. They are teachers, entrepreneurs, tech workers, attorneys, doctors, nurses. So when so many people suddenly leave their jobs, the impact is bound to be substantial. But that's not all. Israel's massive call for reserve soldiers costs money. Where does it go? In restoration of infrastructure and housing for the army. Preparation for a long campaign rehabilitation of injured soldiers, and caring for the families of fallen soldiers. This, among other things, adds to the cost of war between Israel and Hamas, which is estimated to be at least $6.8 billion. That's 1.5% of Israel's GDP. Compare this with costs of previous wars Israel has fought. In 2006, Israel fought the Second Lebanon War. It lasted for 34 days and cost about $2.4 billion. The Gaza War in 2008, also known as Operation Cast Lead, lasted for three weeks. That cost came up to $835 million. This time, the cost is expected to be much higher and the duration, no one knows. Now here's the catch. Israel's past wars paralyzed parts of the country, but they didn't completely shut it down because they didn't last long enough. When the missiles stopped, reservists went back to work, so the country's economy managed to bounce back. And the same applies here. The economic damage depends on how long the war goes on. Where does the Israeli economy stand now? When Israel declared a war against Hamas, local stocks and bonds fell. Many businesses and schools remained closed. International airlines stopped most flights to Tel Aviv. This week, Israel's central bank said it will sell up to $30 billion in foreign exchange to boost the Israeli currency, the shekel, and prevent its collapse. Despite this, the currency weakened by over 2%. So far this week, the main Israeli stock index is down 6%. And this is insult to injury. Economic problems in Israel have persisted since the beginning of the year due to political instability over the judicial overhaul. One of the worst hit has been Israel's tech sector. You see, high-tech industries have been the fastest growing sector in Israel, 
Israel boasts the second largest tech ecosystem outside of Silicon Valley, which accounts for a fifth of the GDP. There are over 500 global tech companies in Israel. They employ over 100,000 people. So the war is a major disruption to Israel's tech sector. Almost every major global tech company has offices in Israel, including Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, Wipro, and Oracle. For now, work has continued from them. They have just shifted to remote work, but reports say turbulent times await. If the conflict escalates, the firms may move out of Israel completely. They may shift operations to India or other locations, such as West Asia or Eastern Europe. If you're wondering why these locations, it's because of similar talent capabilities and time zones. But tech companies aren't the only ones taking a hit in Israel. It's also retail, with brands like H&M and Zara closing stores across the country. Logistics firms like FedEx have suspended its services there, and tourism is shutting down. At this point, it's difficult to predict the amount of economic damage Israel will sustain. But the longer the war goes on for, the more it will hurt its economy. That's all we have on this episode of Vantage. Make sure you tune in on Saturday and Sunday and we'll have more updates from Ground Zero. Yesterday we told you about Operation Ajay. India launched it to bring back citizens from Israel. The first batch of Indians has landed in the country. We leave you those, those pictures. Thank you for watching.